coming. Um, I think I've been here before about a hundred times, and and uh, you know this is a very in we good. Okay, this is a very interesting topic for me actually because typically when I come here we talk about the pathophysiology of dry eye, and we talk about the immunology of the ocular surface. We talk about allergy things like that, but somebody once asked me as an industrial scientist, as somebody who's working in industry doing basic research, what's the difference between you and an academic scientist? What's the big difference? What, you know, what do you do that's different? And, and really, if you were to go into my laboratory or an academic laboratory, they would look exactly the same. We do the same protein chemistry, we do the same molecular biology, we do the same immunology techniques, we have in vivo models, all these things are exactly the same. The big difference between an industrial scientist, a pharmaceutical scientist, somebody looking for a drug, and an academic scientist is that I wake up every morning thinking about targets. What is the target in a disease that I can play with, that I can interdict with, that will make somebody's life better if they have this disease? That's my focus. If it's not related to that, I as an industrial scientist am not interested. I can't spend 30 years of my life looking at a G-coupled protein receptor unless I think that's really important to make a patient feel better. And that's really the only difference. So when we started talking about this topic, I thought it was interesting because we're going to talk about essentially what are the targets in dry eye. With all the research we did and others, what are the things that we can look at today that we can attack in a patient and make them feel better. And so that's my goal is to kind of go through some of the data that we've come with, come out with, that you can, so you can see how these drugs have attacked these particular targets. We don't have a drug for every single target, but we do know what the pathology is. So I'm gonna start out talking about the pathology very briefly. Um, anybody who's heard us talk over the last several years, we can give several seminars just on the pathology, but we'll touch on that and then I'm just going to go through a series of targets and, and fill up our time that way and hopefully you'll have some questions at the end. I will say that, that for those of you that are training to be clinicians, that it is important, and I say this to my daughter who's a, a medical student, that she should be much like Marga Kolonje or my other close colleague Steve Flugfelder who don't look at patients as box checkers. They have dry eye, send them off, do this. They have Pemphigoid sent them off to do this. They look at the patient and determine what's going on and tailor the treatment to the process that these patients have. And I think that's the best thing you can do is to gain an understanding as to what the patient is really going through when you see them. If you're going to be a scientist, same thing. You need to learn to read a paper, get into it, beat it up, and come out with conclusions as to really what's happening with these patients so that your work is relevant to them. Okay, so, so I, I think that uh, Professor Colonge told you kind of what I'm involved in and I, I have my, my fingers in different, in different pots and probably not doing a great job in any of them, but uh, okay, so where does this? Uh, is there an arrow on this thing or what? It was here. No, no, not the other one. This one. No, that's a pointer. Doesn't work. Did, did it's they pull? <laughs> oh. That would help. Yeah. Oh, that's the other one. I think it's okay. Okay, so I did this for a long time, as you might tell. So this was me when we started. I started in 89 doing this. This was, was me in 1991. She's now a medical student. So I'll let you know how old I am, actually. And this, this was us at a, at a race, and she was just not even one year old at that time. But as your research gets better, so do you, okay? You start to improve, you look better, and so here I am in 2015. I think that I, you know, I think I've improved. And, and uh, you know, and uh, the sunglasses even, they're, they're even better, so that's good. Okay, so let's start out talking about what does dry eye look like? 
Some of you have seen this picture before. It's my favorite picture because it really describes what the role of environment is in initiating this disease. So what we have here is a gentleman that lives in a very dry environment. He's obviously an Arab. He lives out in the desert and he has developed very serious dry eye. Okay, so we know the environment is playing a role here. We also know that there's a lot of pain associated with this disease. Okay, this is a chronic pain syndrome. And so in order to talk to you and to see you as he's speaking to you, he has to put a little stick between his lids to keep his eye open so he can see you. But when the pain and the dryness becomes too much, then he just pulls on this string and his eyes close and he develops a more normal environment over the ocular surface and it makes it more palatable for him to talk with you. This is an inflammatory disease. Okay, and we'll talk about this. This is immune-based inflammation. And people now talk about, oh, well, you know, I have some patients that have inflammation-induced dry eye and other patients that it's really non-inflammatory. Not true. Dry eye is an inflammation-based disease. Doesn't mean you can see it at the slit lamp, and that's the big problem. The inflammation that you're looking at does not mean you have a red eye. Okay, the conjunctiva, if you look in the conjunctiva, if you look in the meibomian glands and the lacrimal glands, you can easily see that this is an inflammatory based disease. And in fact, I started in 89 doing this work and you know, I wasn't alone, there were some others that were involved in this. It wasn't until 2007 at the initial dues conference that we actually got the word inflammation into the definition of dry eye. And it wasn't easy. There was a lot of fighting going on to make that happen. But this then became a well-known inflammation-based disease. And it increases with age, as we know. And there are many risk factors. There's hormone, hormonal influences that are involved. So a lot of these types of dry eye are skewed mostly towards the female population, the peri- and postmenopausal female. But there are certain types of dry eye, in particular meibomian gland disease, which you find more prevalent in men. Okay, so there are different types. You can have systemic autoimmune disease. So people who have lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, and other systemic autoimmunities can have a very serious dry eye associated with it. But you don't have to have that. You can have a local autoimmune event. So if you look at the patient's blood, there are no circulating autoantibodies. But in fact, this is autoimmunity. And I, I be very careful when I say that because a lot of doctors go, well, my patients don't have autoimmune disease. And I'm not saying that every patient has systemic autoimmune disease, but they can have local autoimmunity as well. But this is against the self-antigen. So it meets the definition of autoimmunity. And this is a, a picture given to me from Marga here, but what you can see is if you look in the ocular surfaces of patients, and you take samples of tears, and a lot of that work has been done here. My lab did a lot as well. You can find pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines expressed both by PCR or in the tear film by Luminex, multi-bead analysis, actually looking at the proteins. And you can find both of those in these patients. There is an upregulation of class II antigen, human uh, lymphocyte antigen or leukocyte antigen expression, elevation of adhesion molecule expression, so we published a paper, we'll show you a little later, on ICAM-1 and its expression in dry eye and inflammatory cell infiltration. And yet, if you looked at this eye and assuming it wasn't stained with lysamine green, but you would not see any of that. And I think that's the problem and that's the thing we face going forward when we looked at dry eye initially. So Steve Flugfelder and I and a rheumatologist named Bob Fox came up with the concept of the lacrimal functional unit. And so everything is really based on this, and this is how we secrete a normal tear film environment on the ocular surface. So it starts here on the ocular surface. We have a tear film that is secreted as needed, maintaining a very tight composition over the ocular surface. Okay, that's critically important because dry eye, as you will hear, is not at all a disease of dryness. That may come later. Dry eye is a disease of altered tear film composition. So your tear film here that's secreted does two major things. It protects you from infection, number one. 
antiviral, <laughs> antibacterial. It keeps your eye from being infected, but it also contains many, many proteins. And Roger Byerman, who was back at the LSU Eye Center at the time and has been in Singapore for a long time, has done a lot of mass spec studies on tears, and he's found up to 1,500 different proteins in the tears, and at least half of them are involved in being trophic to the ocular surface, to protecting the ocular surface, to nourishing the ocular surface, to keeping it functional and competent to protect the eye. So this is all important. And so what happens is that this, the cornea, and many of you know this, is the most densely innervated surface in the body. It's 40 to 60 times more densely innervated than tooth pulp. Okay, as we've evolved, maintenance of sight has been paramount. So when you get a stimulus in the eye, it's almost always painful, causes you to tear, close your eyes, and withdraw your head very quickly. It's all about the body's reflex to protect sight. Okay, but what we're talking about here is subconscious stimulation of these nerve endings, and there are no synapses in the cornea. These are all free nerve endings. Subconscious stimulation of these nerve endings results in afferent nerve traffic through the ophthalmic branch of the fifth cranial nerve, which is the trigeminal nerve, so afferent nerve um, traffic goes to the central nervous system where the cortex and the brainstem get involved in integrating it and formulating a response. And then what you have is the other end of the reflex, which is efferent nerve traffic through the seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve. Okay, and this nerve traffic comes out back to the periphery and nerve endings from this fiber track end up at the main and accessory lac lacrimal glands. Many of you know that most of our daily tear flow come from the accessory glands, the glands that are known as Wolfring and Krauss. But we have the main lacrimal gland here to dump large amounts of tears onto the surface in case we have some sort of problem. But nerve fibers are also found around the, the conjunctival goblet cells and around the meibomian glands. So what this tells us is we secrete tears in a very organized, as needed fashion to keep the composition very, very tight on the ocular surface. Okay, so the concept of basal tear flow is not one that I really agree with. We don't just flow tears onto the ocular surface for the heck of it. The surface composition is very tightly controlled. And when it becomes abnormal, that's when you have disease. Okay, so this is just a picture of some of these nerve leashes. It was given to me by Carl Marford from the University of Indiana School of Medicine. You can see that there's quite a few of them there. And what happens is, is we get a normal tear film on the surface. And this is just a diagram from a book we wrote uh, back in 2004. But this is the ocular surface. And what we have here are mucins, both soluble mucins. And you can see these little ones attached to the surface. They are transmembrane mucins. And they form a gel. So our knowledge of the tear film, our definition of the tear film, has gone from a sandwich of water, lipids, and mucins to actually a hydrated mucin gel. And it makes a lot more sense as to how it stays intact on the ocular surface. And you can see that there are lots and lots of proteins here in the aqueous portion. And those are the proteins that I talked about previously that are anti-infective and ocular surface supportive. And then when we have dry eye, everything changes. When we have inflammation there, everything changes. So you can see the lipid layer on top secreted by the meibomian glands. The profile of those lipids has been shown to be absolutely abnormal. And they are, don't organize themselves normally. They don't form a seal on the surface. You can see there are lots of breaks. And what this is depicting here is lots of evaporation of the aqueous. When you have lots of evaporation of the aqueous, you concentrate the salts on the ocular surface and it becomes very inflammatory. And it is part of the pathology that ramps up the inflammation on the eye. It increases the osmolarity of the tears. You can see also the activation of a lot of cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. You can measure them in the tears and we do this routinely. And 
there's abnormal mucin secreted. So it's all abnormal. And because they're abnormal mucins, the shear forces across the eye when you blink, for example, are very disruptive. And you can see here that the junctions of the cells here are broken. We're sloughing a lot of epithelial cells. And we are exposing that vast neural network in the ocular surface that results in the pain that we feel when we're suffering from chronic dry eye. OK, so that's just what's going on here. So this was an initial piece of data that really started us thinking really about the immune aspects of this disease. This is from Steve Flugfelder's lab at Houston. And he did impression cytologies on the ocular surface, on the cornea. For those of you who are not familiar with that, it's just a little filter paper disc, essentially. You press it onto the conjunctiva, peel it off, taking a layer of cells, and you can stain those cells for all sorts of markers. So in the normal eye, if you stain for class II antigen, HLADR, on these cells, and what you see are essentially the Langerhans cells. That's what LC is for. These are dendritic cells. These are the early wake-up call of the immune system. Okay? Target one. Okay, we're going to talk about this as, as being an important target in this disease. And you can see them here. They light up because they are already prepared to process antigen to get the ball rolling immunologically speaking, to get things started very quickly because obviously if we have severe inflammation of the eye and it is untreated, you will have problems seeing very rapidly. So the eye is prepared to have a very rapid response and that's how this happens. You can see this is lit up. But if you do the exact same process in a dry eye patient, in an ocular surface inflammatory situation, you can still see the Langerhans cells here Okay? But if you notice, the underlying epithelium also lights up. This is a very hot, immunologically active eye. Okay? This is a very angry eye. And we've learned since then that not only do we have conjunctival Langerhans cells, but we have an entire array of dendritic cells that populate the ocular surface and are ready to create an inflammatory response to any challenge that it faces, whether it's real or perceived. Perceived being autoimmunity. Okay, so we're getting near the end of the first part of how this works, and we're going to talk about the cycle of, of immunology involved here. But if we start here on the ocular surface when there's a chronic stress, and some of you know the models we've worked with, but when there's a chronic stress here, then what happens on the ocular surface is that there, these dendritic cells, and I'm sorry this is a little bit small, but this says IDC, which means immature dendritic cell. It's sitting there. It is not active. It's waiting to be activated. And what happens is, with this stress, there are antigens that pop out on the surface. Okay, there may be different types of antigens, and they pop out on the surface, and they are processed by these dendritic cells. The dendritic cell is saying, hey, we got a problem here. I can detect it. I need to process this antigen and tell somebody about it. Okay? What the dendritic cell doesn't know is that's not a bacteria. It's not a virus. This is us. It's our own proteins. It's our own antigens. And this is autoimmunity. And this is part of the problem that occurs in dry eye. This is really an autoimmune response. And so this thing will, whoops, let me go back, will process this antigen. And it will leave, see now it says mature dendritic cell, has the antigen on it. It will leave the ocular surface and travel via the lymphatics, the ocular lymphatics, to the draining lymph node. Okay? So here's this cell. It's holding up a sign going, I got this antigen here, guys. I'm coming to visit you, so get ready. And down here you have what's called a whole population of naive Th0 type cells. And all they're doing is sitting there, waiting to be told what to do. They're not active. They're in the lymph node. This is what the lymph node is there for. And when this cell pops out of the lymphatics, it will tell these cells, you know, this is what you're going to do. I'm going to assign this thing to you. We have a problem on the ocular surface. And so these cells then will become, for those of you that know something about inflammation, Th1, Th17 cells. B cells, cells that are built to respond to the problem on the ocular surface. In the meantime, we have an innate response going here. 
all sorts of cytokines being secreted in a, in a non-specific manner just to try to get rid of whatever the challenge is. But these guys, these guys are like missiles, like cruise missiles. They are primed and targeted to attack an antigen on the ocular surface. And they leave the lymph node and they travel via the circulation now. Okay? And they travel via the circulation and they pop out throughout the body, they pop out where they see these antigens being expressed. And there's all sorts of science about what the cell homing really is. What causes a cell to address itself to a specific part of the body. But one thing we know is that these cells don't go anywhere else. If you have a problem in the eye, they go to the eye. And we're going to show you the model that we've worked with that really address that. But they come out and they become activated on the surface. And so what you see here are cells secreting Th1 and Th17 cytokines directed specifically at that antigen. They become activated there. You can see B cells here secreting antibodies. We were the first ones to show, in fact, that B cells were involved at all because this is very much viewed as a T cell disease. Okay, and so you can see that there's a lot of damage here. Okay, this is a chronic, completely activatable immune response on the ocular surface. Okay, so the targets, the goals that we want to do here, and this is just a very simple slide, we want to get rid of these activated CD4 positive T helper cells. These cells that are here, abnormally activated to attack something on the ocular surface that they believe to be foreign, when in fact it isn't. Okay, so we, we need to get rid of these cells. We need to sustain things called T regulatory cells, cells that shut down and quiet the T cell response. We want to sustain those. We want to quiet the ocular surface. And finally, we want to protect the cells on the ocular surface and the lacrimal gland so that they can continue to do a normal job. So this is kind of the three things we want. And then, you know, we just call this rebalancing the ocular surface. And I guess when, when the immunology course was going on here a lot, I actually gave a talk from time to time on rebalancing the ocular surface. And it's kind of what we were doing here. Okay, so just to go through this really quickly, this is a different way of looking at it. We have here a stimulus on the ocular surface. These immature dendritic cells or antigen presenting cells process the antigen. They leave via the lymphatics and they travel to the draining lymph node. And that's the, this is what's called the afferent arm of the immune response. And so here we are in the lymph node and these cells are being activated and then they get primed and targeted back to the ocular surface and create damage. And so this is the, we're looking at the targets within this particular model as to see what we can do about this pathology. Okay, so the first thing we did was make a model. Okay, you need some way to analyze the different portions of this disease. And so T cells are what it's all about for us at the beginning. And yes, in the state of California, as in many states, you can actually get your own personalized license plate. And so my kids are very embarrassed by this, but yet I did it anyway, so. Yeah. Okay. So our model was to cause a desiccating stress on the ocular surface. This is the model that led to a little facility that we know of downstairs in this very building which is the human equivalent of this, is the, the, the chamber that you all use to do clinical trials. And it started out like this. So these are mice. They're put in these modified cages. You can see how this is kind of like screens on the ocular surface here. And these mice are in front of fans that were placed at specific distance and in a low humidity. And within five days, and we've gone as much as 10 days of des what we call desiccating stress, we can look at these mice and these mice come down with dry eye. Okay, they also get scopolamine three times a day which dries up secretions and they come down with, in their tears, a whole 
bunch of different cytokines and chemokines. This is substance P, CGRP, and nerve growth factor. Neurogenic inflammation, these are indicators of neurogenic inflammation that you would see in dry eye. Their tear production goes down, as does their tear turnover, so we have a lot of stagnation of the fluid on the ocular surface. Their corneal barrier function is compromised, as you saw in the diagram. So if you stain them with Oregon green dye or other types of fluorescinated compounds, they will stain very readily. There is a T-cell infiltration within the conjunctiva and the lacrimal glands, both ends of the lacrimal functional unit we talked about. Their goblet cells go down, and there is increased cell death on the ocular surface, increased apoptosis. Okay? You don't know it yet, but I've pointed to several targets now within dry eye that we're going to look at. Okay, so the one thing we can do, and, and when we first did this model, people came to us and said, you know what, we, we, we agree there's inflammation, but that's not dry eye. That's just a phenomenon associated with dry eye. Dry eye is really something else. So I was fortunate enough to be working with one of the leading immunologists in this field, Jerry Niederkorn, and he said, you know, Mike, he said, there is a tenant of immunology that states that if you believe a cell is responsible for a disease, you can prove that by transferring just those cells to a naive recipient and seeing if you can transfer the disease. It's just a very simple but very important tenet of immunology. And we did just that. We developed dry eye in these mice. We went to their draining lymph nodes. We isolated all the CD4 C T cells and we, trans uh, we transferred all of these CD4 T cells, about five million of them, into this guy. This is a nude mouse. He has no fur, but he also has none of his own T cells. They are athymic. So every T cell in that mouse is one we put there. And we injected them not into the eye, but into the abdomen, intraperitoneally. And 48 hours later, this guy who is sitting in his cage, he's never been in the chamber. He's just sitting in his cage, he gets an injection of cells, we let him go. 48 hours later, he comes down with a complete case of dry eye. Okay? These cells home from the, the peritoneum to the ocular surface, and you can see here in the conjunctiva, in the cornea, and in the lacrimal gland, restricted homing of T cells to these tissues, increased cytokine levels, all the same things here that you would see in this mouse. Okay? T cells now become a really important target to us. Okay, so when we first started doing this, it was all about T cells. Now that's changed a little bit over time. But the other thing we found is when we did the exact same experiment, okay, in a white, furry, intact, immune mouse, so we made dry eye cells, we did the same adoptive transfer, we injected this guy, he essentially ignored them. Okay? And if you look at the ocular surface here, you can see the goblet cells and the fornix of the conjunctiva. There's no infiltrate of cells. Here's the meibomian gland. Everything looks totally normal. Absolutely ignore them. And we were fascinated by that. When you are standing on a curb and the bus goes past you and just sprays you with, with diesel fumes, you know, or you're outside on a very hot, dry day and there's all sorts of pollens around and, you know, you may not be allergic, but your eyes are, get very irritated, you don't come down with dry eye. Unless you're an unfortunate individual who's prone to that. So what happened here is, we believed that there was a population of cells called T-regulatory cells that were protecting this mouse and us in general from coming down with these chronic inflammations, this autoimmune type phenomenon. And we said, well, let's, let's run the same experiment, but this time, let's get rid of those T-regulatory cells and see what, see what happens. So these cells are CD25+, plus and they have different markers on the surface. And what we did is, we injected this guy with anti-CD25 antibody before we gave the injection of the cells. And lo and behold, he comes down with a complete case of dry eye. Okay, so now we're interfering with the ability of the T regulatory cells to stop the disease. Another big target. Okay, so I love to, to, to talk about this because when I happened to be at Allergan, we actually built a chamber to run this model that was so important. So this is a chamber here that has its own environment. And of course, the translation to the human model is downstairs here. 
Okay? And, and, you know, for those people who work here, and we always tend to, to believe that stuff from somewhere else is better than what we have, there's nothing better than what you have here. The chamber here is the most sophisticated one being used in the eye today. Because you can control humidity, airflow, light schedules, and most importantly, pressure. It's the only chamber I know of, other than maybe one at NASA, that can really control pressure. So you can put somebody in an airplane. The first paper validating this, this uh, chamber was actually that. It was an airplane-like environment. You can put them on top of a mountain. You can do all sorts of experimentation. And I have to say that, that the studies that were done with this chamber in terms of validating it are unlike anything else that have been done in the field. So people are making money out of chambers now, but nobody really understands the chamber like this one here. And so I'm, I'm complimenting you all, and I, I have kind of rode on your backs as you've done all the work on this stuff. But it's been a, it's been a, really, uh, a really good ride, and, and this is really developing quite a reputation. Okay, so I thought what I would do is toss a couple of drugs into the mix, okay? There are two drugs that are now approved in the United States for dry eye. This is the new one. Okay, so based on what we d had done, a company called Shire, who actually bought this from Sarcode, but, but they have a drug that is an anti-LFA uh, marker. So LFA is the, the putative ligand for ICAM-1. So when these cells go through the vessels and they express ICAM-1 and they bind to LFA, leukocyte functional antigen, on the surface of the endothelial cells and come out of the vessels into the eye, that's how they get there. What they did is just get something that binds to the LFA and prevents that blockage so that these cells can't get out. And in fact, I, mean, I don't want to go into this a lot, but here's LFA as the cognate ligand for ICAM-1. And so what we have here is that these cells typically come through. And then here's LFA binding. And then if you inhibit the LFA binding, where is it? So then you, you get the situation where these cells cannot come through the vessels into the tissue. It was one target that we looked at that actually has been developed into a drug. And then of course, the old one, which is cyclosporin. Okay, cyclosporin was developed primarily because it's a T cell drug. And the story behind cyclosporin is that it's a drug that was developed it was actually developed starting as an antifungal, but it really was developed and its utility was because it was, it was inhibiting T cell activation. That was the initial understanding of cyclosporin. Dry eye was thought to be a T cell drug. Corn, uh, graft rejection, like hearts, lungs, and whatnot, their rejection was a T cell response. And so that's why this drug was given to those types of people. People who have a heart transplant or a kidney transplant are given cyclosporin to prevent rejection. Previous to that, they were given large doses of steroids, and what they would die from was opportunistic infection. So this drug saved a lot of people's lives. And when the whole dry eye story started cropping up, and, and it first started in dogs, uh, one of our co-authors, Bob Fox, who's a world-renowned rheumatologist, and Bob Fox said, you know what, I'm a Sjogren's syndrome expert. And to, de to definitely tell someone that they have uh, or diagnosed Sjogren's syndrome, they would take a labial biopsy from the lip of, of um, a salivary gland. And they would look for T cell infiltrates into the salivary gland. And what he said was, if you're seeing dry eye, mucosal dryness in the eye, which these patients also have, and they have mucosal dryness in the mouth, it's got to be the same thing. It's got to be a shared antigen that's doing that. And that's why cyclosporin is so important. And it was his suggestion that we should try cyclosporin first. So this was being marketed around an allergy and actually bought it. But what it does is there's a, there's a signal. This is the T cell. Here's the cell membrane. Here's the nucleus. This is nuclear factor for T cell activation that's phosphorylated. Here's calcineurin. And what happens is that there's a signal that occurs that results in calcium transmission into the cell. And so calmodulin and, and uh, um, I'm blanking here, calcineurin form a complex that then binds to NFAT. This becomes dephosphorylated. 
This goes into the nucleus. Once N fat is in the nucleus, it binds to the promoter region of DNA and results in the synthesis and secretion of a whole bunch of inflammatory cytokines, and that's how these cells become activated. The other thing that occurs is that CD147, which is mTOR essentially, is on the surface here, becomes uh, liquefied or solubilized. It, it's around the cell, and essentially what it does, it acts as a chemotactic agent to draw their cells to the, to the site of inflammation. And if you have cyclosporin in the environment, when these cells come out of the vessel into the tissue, it will bind here to this complex. It will prevent this dephosphorylation. Oops, sorry, I'm going backwards here. It will prevent this dephosphorylation. This thing cannot go into the nucleus. The cell will then die by apoptosis because it cannot activate. The other thing it will do is prevent expression of CD147 on the surface. So you get prevention of T cell activation, prevention of, of um, chemotactic inviting of other cells to the tissue. And so this is a really big target for us. T cells were always a big target. And that's how this started. We also found out that cyclosporin is anti-inflammatory. It inhibits NF-kappa B, for those of you who understand what that is as far as inflammation. It's very important there. And it has an anti-apoptotic effect, which we're going to talk about a little bit at the end. And then finally, the big one is that it inhibits T cell activation. Okay, so T cells are important in this disease. They're, they're homing to the tissue. Their activation are important targets. And this was one of the drugs that, that uh, targeted that, that inhibited that. I'm not going to tell you about a lot of other drugs because we have a lot of other targets actually without drugs. But they are interesting targets, one that, that uh, people are investigating to, to date. Excuse me. So the next thing we started to do was say, well, you remember that circle? Let's go back to the beginning. You know, if everything I've been telling you is true, then inhibiting dendritic cell activation, like we said at the very beginning, these dendritic cells become mature by processing antigen and whatnot, if we can inhibit that, we should be able to stop this process dead. Is this a target or not? So here's the, the circle as we showed it. This is just kind of the same type of thing. We, I'll, I'll go through this, I'm not going to say this again. But up here at the beginning, at the very beginning, are these cells that process the antigen. Okay, so we have macrophages and dendritic cells. These are preventional, they're what we call professional antigen presenting cells. Okay, what happens if we could stop those? Are they a target? What happens if we could stop them? So there is a compound called clodronate. Clodronate gets rid of bone marrow derived cells, CD11 C positive cells. And we thought, okay, let's get rid of these cells and then we'll just run the model and see what happens. Can we get dry eye or not? And so we made up clodronate, or Jerry Niederkorn's lab made up clodronate in lipids, which are little pockets of lipids. Some of you know what they are. So some of the liposomes were controlled. They had phosphate buffered saline in them. Some of them had the clodronate. And we gave them, let's see if I can show this. So what we did is we gave them subconjunctivally four days before they were put in the chamber, one day before they were put in the chamber, and actually the third day of desiccating stress. And they either got the control, PBS loaded liposome, or the actual clodronate loaded liposomes. And then we looked at these mice. So do they get dry eye or not? Okay, and we counted the number of antigen presenting cells on the surface after clodronate, ocular surface inflammation, and our hypothesis was that de depleting these cells would decrease the severity of the disease. Okay, and in fact, what we saw here, if we gave them the PBS, there were still a lot of inflammatory cells there. Very few, as you can see, after clodronate treatment. Okay, so these are monocytes. These are bone marrow derived cells as well. You can see that there's still quite a few here, but after clodronate there's almost none. And in fact, if you looked at cytokines in the tears of these guys, when you gave clodronate, you can just see here the gray bars, they were reduced significantly. So it really inhibited the development of dry eye. Here's the CD4 cell counts on the surface, T helper cells. Here's the normal amount. Here would be the amount with a dry-eyed mouse. You gave clodronate, knocked them right back down. 
Goblet cells are decreased because of a lot of inflammation. You have squamous metaplasia on the surface. If you give clodronate, the goblet cells are protected. Okay, there's no inflammatory decrease in these cells. So we're essentially stopping the process of inflammation. And in fact, we took it a step further. We did the adoptive transfer study. So we gave these guys clodronate here, okay? And then we took the cells and we just injected them into this guy. So if these cells in this mouse's, in this mouse's lymph node had any hint that there was any dry eye, then we would see activity here. This guy would get dry eye. If they did not know there was any dry eye, if they were not receiving any antigen for the surface, this guy would be essentially normal. Okay, and so this is the recipient mouse. He's never been in the chamber. He receives cells from either a mouse that received phosphate buffered saline liposomes or received clodronate treated liposomes. And in fact, what you see here is when they get injected, the guys that get the, the uh, cells from the mouse that were treated with PBS, he has a full case of inflammation. You can see all sorts of cells there. There are no goblet cells here, but in the clodronate treated mouse, you can see there's all sorts of goblet cells in the conjunctival fornix. There's a clean cornea. <clears throat> the inflammation score is less. The CD4 cell counts are essentially back to normal or even lower. And you can see here that lots of goblet cells remain whereas the inflamed mouse has, has almost none. Really good target, okay? Dendritic cells, if you can specifically target them, you can stop this disease cold. And in fact, if you look in the cytokines, the tiers of this recipient mouse, any mouse that received cells from a clodronate treated donor, Nothing. This is, they're just, this is just a whole bunch of different cytokines. There's interferon, gamma IL-2, CCL5, a chemokine, TNF-alpha. I mean, they're all there, and none of them are, are elevated if you get rid of the dendritic cell. So we know that this is a really important target for dry eye. Okay. And then we did one final experiment for those of you that are clinicians, because you might be sitting there, if you're still awake, Thinking about, in fact, by the time the patient walks in the door here, they've already got disease. And you can't stop it now because the disease is happening, the cells are coming into the ocular surface, so on and so forth. So is this a therapeutic target or not? So what we did is we just made a dry eye mouse. These cells are activated, they are ready to make disease, and we inject them into this guy except we injected this guy with the clodronate or the, or the uh, control, PBS. Would that have an effect or not? It turns out that these cells are not really secreting cytokines systemically. They need to be activated by the antigen on the ocular surface when they come out and create disease that way so that they secrete all of these cytokines. But if you put clodronate here, there's no disease. I'll just put it all up here. So you can see here, there's the CD4 cell counts. This is the PBS and untreated controls. But in the clodronate eye, very few CD4 cells are there in, at all. The goblet cells are protected with the clodronate, but not with the PBS. And the number of CD4 T cells are much higher in the untreated than the, the clodronate. OK, so we have a couple of targets we've gone through already. We've gone through the T cells. We've gone through the dendritic cells. And then I had an idea. I was reading some article. And they were saying that they were using rituximab. I don't know if, if you guys know rituximab. It's an anti-CD20 antibody. It's used primarily to treat B-cell lymphomas. It is an anti-B-cell drug. And they have been using it in certain types of diseases like lupus that were thought to be more T-cell type diseases and having some success therapeutically. So I said, well, let's give it a shot. Okay, we'll try it. Mice don't use um, anti-CD20, they use anti-CD19. But we looked at that. We wanted to look at B cells in this disease. OK, so what we did was a kind of an interesting study. We did the same adoptive transfer that we've been doing, but we didn't transfer any cells at all. All we did was go into the blood and isolate specific dry eye specific serum IgG to the, to the mouse, to the recipient mouse. And in fact, well, I didn't really put it here. And in fact, what we saw was a big type of dry eye response. But of course, there are no T cells in that mouse. We didn't put any there. So what we saw was a huge neutrophil response. 
Okay, which is a real lesson that if the immune system wants to get something done, it's going to get it done, T cells or not. So there was a huge neutrophil response in that mouse, big inflammation. And in fact, if it's B cells, and because it's humoral immunology, it is not killing cells specifically, it's doing it through the use of different types of secretions, you always want to look for complement. I was told you guys know what complement is, so that, that's good, but here it is detected after dry eye, three weeks in the desiccating stretch, you can see here along the basement membrane. And so what we did is, as I said, isolated the serum, we translated it over, and then we looked at, histologically at the tissues. So this, these are controls over here. This is the, just the nude control with control serum injected. You can see there's nothing going on. Totally clean corneas, lots of goblet cells, very normal. And the way you get rid of complement is with something called cobra venom factor. I personally would not want to be the person that had to isolate that, but somebody does it. And so we get this cobra venom factor, it, it eliminates complement. And so we can see here whether this is a complement related things, but we gave venom factor and control serum and there was no problems there, there was no changes. Here is the active one, this is the nude mouse that received the three weeks desiccating stress serum and you can see here that there are infiltrates, there are loss of goblet cells, we have a complete um, inflammatory situation here, but if we give them cobra venom factor at the same time, you can see there's no infiltrates, there are lots of goblet cells and essentially this, the score goes right back down to normal. So B cells play a role here. And nobody as of yet has actually used rituximab in a dry eye patient, but that's a potential target as well. And so the way we think that this works is we have B cells that process antigen kind of like T cells. They then bind to a T cell, see the B cell? That's very common. This is the way B cells become mature. They bind to a T cell, the T cell tells them which way to go. They become plasma cells and they secrete tissue antibodies that are complement fixing and that's how they, they are involved in this particular disease. And then finally, protection of the lacrimal glands and ocular surface epithelium. So you remember the three balls and the little funnel at the beginning. So this is the final thing is how do we protect the ocular surface? But one thing we did very, on, very early on was look at apoptosis and we did this with tunnel staining. So back then that was the way you would look at apoptosis and what we saw the brown cells are dying, the blue cells are discontinuing to thrive. We saw a very bad looking picture. We saw a lot of cell death on the surface of the conjunctiva. Underneath here, lots of CD4 T cells <coughs> that were continuing to thrive and, and become in inflammatory here. They were activated. But the picture that was the most scary to me was this one on the upper right because you can see these terminally differentiated cells within the accessory lacrimal gland were dying. Okay, see lots of brown cells here. Okay, once those cells die, they're done. They are terminally differentiated, professional tear secreting cells. Okay, so this tells us that the gland was dying. And as a clinician, it also tells you, you want to get to these people early. You don't want to wait till they're end stage to treat them. And you can see lots of live cells in the interlobular space in the accessory lacrimal gland. So what we wanted to know is preventing death in these epithelial cells, is that a good target? So we know what apoptosis is all about, and, and Carlos, I'm not going to talk about necroptosis today or anything like that, but, but apoptosis, so the big way that this occurs, specifically on these ocular surface cells, is through something called the mitochondrial permeability transition pore. Okay, very fancy term, but of all the data I'm showing you today, this may be the coolest experiment I've ever run. Well, that's not true. I've run a lot of cool experiments, but, but anyway. So here's the mitochondria. Mitochondria, for one thing, are loaded with calcium. They are the highest calcium-containing part of the cell. Okay? And they have this little door here. And I, you don't have to worry about this whole slide. It's very fancy, but what happens is in an inflammatory state when the cell is being challenged and is going to undergo apoptosis, this little pore opens up, cytochrome C comes out along with calcium into the cell and that activates 
cast bases, including cast base 3. So we have effector cast base 3. And once you see cast base 3 in the cytosol of a cell, it will undergo apoptosis, program cell death. So we needed to keep this pore shut. And in fact, on the leaflet, on the internal leaflet of that pore, is a cyclophilin moiety, which, by the way, is the natural ligand for cyclosporin. So one thing cyclosporin does is keep that pore shut, which was very, very cool. So these were some dry-eyed dogs. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. This, that's for a different thing. But you can see here, these are the cells before treatment. And after treatment, those cells are gone. And you can see how blue the epithelium is. OK, so we're now back to a more normal status. So we took two types of cells. We took cells that were made rather famous by this particular group here, the EOBA, uh, normal human conjunctival cells here. And then the T cells are Jercat cells. This is a human CD3 positive T cell line. And we evaluated them and their mitochondrial permeability transition poor model to see what would happen. So this is the model. Okay? It's a rather simple model. If you take a cell and you expose it to calcium and load it with calcium, okay? So we have it very high in the mitochondria and you can see sort of shaded green here. We have lots of calcium in the cell. We have a very high fluorescence. When you look at the calcium fluorescence from that cell, it's very, very high. And then if you expose that cell to cobalt chloride, it quenches or gets rid of the calcium only in the cytosol. It cannot get into the mitochondria. So you can see here, we have, still have very high levels of calcium here, but none here. So the, the uh, level of the signal is now down. From here, it's now moved to the left, it's now down. And then if you add something like a calcium ionophore or something where it causes the cell to undergo apoptosis, it gets into the mitochondria, causes the calcium to leak out of here, then the symbol goes way down. So wherever the, symbol, the, the signal is, we can determine how much this cell is going to survive and where the calcium is. Okay, so this is, this is just the data. This is very simple. On the top, we have the conjunctival epithelial cells. Okay, so this blue over here is the signal with the entire cell loaded with calcium, mitochondria, cytosol, etc. If you give cobalt chloride, that's the red line. Okay? And then if you give ionomycin, a calcium ionophore that opens the mitochondria, it moves even farther. Okay, so now there's one line I didn't talk to you about, and that is this green line. And I, I apologize you can't see it, but this is the one that has, has cyclosporin. Okay? And if there's cyclosporin present, it sits here at the same level, okay, of the cobalt chloride treated cell. In other words, the mitochondria is still loaded. Okay? And even if you put ionomycin here or stress the cornea, these cells, these corneal cells in a different way, it will not allow the pore to open and it just sits there and keeps it at this level. And it does not shift over. Oddly enough, Okay, and so this sounds very, 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 very complex, but it's not. It's just keeping the pore shut, keeping the cell alive. Oddly enough, in the T cells, if you look here, this is the cobalt chloride treated ones. There's only calcium in the mitochondria. But when you give the ionomycin here, it goes uh, lower, and in fact, the cyclosporin does not protect it. You can see that the, this thing shifts right over on top of that. So the take-home message, message here is cyclosporin protects the epithelial cells, the lacrimal gland secreting cells, the conjunctival epithelium. But those abnormally activated lymphocytes, they're gone. And the cyclosporin helps them go away. Big, big target for this drug. And we didn't even know about it when we started. All right, put the arrows in. Okay. And then finally, Tregs, anti-inflammatory. They do a lot of different things. There are different types of Tregs that I've shown here. This is the way they work. They secrete inhibitory cytokines, such as interleukin-10. They can cause cytolysis 
of abnormally activated cells with granzyme A or granzyme B. They can target dendritic cells and keep them from becoming activated and processing antigen. And they can cause metabolic disruption of cells and cause cell death due to deprivation. So they can do a lot of different things. T regulatory cells are incredibly potent. They are very, very powerful. So we did some work really looking at these guys. We created dry eye as you've seen in this model. I'm not going to go a lot here, but we knew that the T regulatory cells were involved here. I've shown this to you already. So what we wanted to know was by getting rid of these, do we cause disease? I've shown you that. So then what we did was made our own T regulatory cells. And you can make them. We know what the markers are. There's a whole protocol. A, a guy from, um, I forget his name now, Jeff something from UCSF in San Francisco developed a protocol for making these cells. And you can see all the normal markers. They have the CD25 marker that I've talked about before. <clears throat> this is a cytosolic transcription factor, FOXP3. These are all defining T regulatory cells. And so what we did is we took these T regulatory cells and we injected them into mice that were undergoing the model to become inflamed, to become dry eye. And you can see here, this is, this is the in, in vitro ones that we made. And as you increase the ratio, of T regulatory cell to CD4 positive cell, you can see that the amount of interferon gamma, which is the cytokine we chose, goes way back down towards normal. And these are fresh T regulatory cells that we isolated, and you get the same response. Okay, so we know that T regulatory cells are also another target. If we can keep them bolstered up, we can prevent disease. Okay, so we've talked about T cells, dendritic cells, B cells, T regulatory cells. All these processes are important in the generation of dry eye and therefore they are targets for therapies as we go forward. Okay, there are only two that are approved now in the United States and I know in Europe there is a cyclosporin that's approved for serious, more serious dry eye and there are other companies that are working with cyclosporin trying to get it into Europe and there are also several other drugs that people are looking at. So we know that, um, you know, Restasis, the drug I worked at, which worked on, was alone for 14 years in the, the U.S. market. And it's not, not alone anymore. And there's going to be a lot of activity in this particular field. So this is the group from, uh, many of you have seen this slide. This was my group at, at Allergan, and they did, did all the work, and I took all the credit. And then, of course, this is over the years with the group here. I, I really wish Chimma was here because that, he looks like a six-year-old pretty much in that particular, you know, that's a, but and this, this was 2004 on the boat. I mean, that, that's a, like a famous picture, right? Back in the day. So I guess, you know, as I, as I told Professor Pastor, I may not be a child of the EOBA process, but I, I'm kind of a cousin. So I, you know, I kind of show up, and you know how cousins are, they, they show up for a couple of days and then you get sick of them, so then they can go home again. So that, that's kind of me, but, but anyway, I just want to thank you for your attention. I hope that this is helpful for some of you, and, and, uh, and I wish you the best of luck as you go forward with this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.